So this is SNHU IT140, and we are going to be talking about Module 1, Programming Variables, Types, intro, and Intros to Strings. Now, one of the things that I'm going to do while we're talking about this is I'm going to talk about some things, and then I'm going to go over to PyCharm, and we're going to look at how things are actually behaving. And we're going to walk through the code line by line and see what it's doing. I find that to be a very good way of helping to understand what your program is up to. Um, and it also gets us introduced to PyCharm early because PyCharm is what you're going to use for all of your programming projects. So this is the basic building blocks. And what we're going to learn this week is we're going to learn about a variable. We're going to learn about what a statement is. Um, and basically, it's just telling the Python interpreter to do something. We're going to talk about what a string is, because it's very important to know what a string is. We think we know what a string is, but Python has a very specific definition of what a string is and how you can do things with a string. And because Python assumes lots of things are strings, if you don't tell it otherwise, it's really important to understand what a string literal is. And then we're also just going to generally talk about the Python interpreter. The Python interpreter is the thing that executes your code against the computer. And so we really kind of just need a basic understanding of that. We've got a couple of new functions. Well, everything's new this week. So we've got a couple of functions we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about a function called input, and we're going to talk about a function called print. Input reads something from the input. Now, sometimes, especially these days, when you get people who are used to a gaming world, when they're playing a game, they've got their game console, they've got a joystick, they've got their cell phone. But input can be anything. Input can be audio. Input can also be text from a console window. So I'm gonna, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to give you examples of that because this is how you control each and every one of your programs. And it's how Zybooks is going to create is going to um, control each and every one of your programs. You're going to tell your program to stop and wait. And you're going to wait for external input. Now, if you're developing a great video game, that would be from the game console. But for what we're doing, it's going to be somebody typing in to a keyboard. Print is the opposite of input. Print gives information back to the user. So we're going to be talking more about that and how to use them. And then we've got some operators. We've got a single equal sign, and we've got the pound sign. The single equal sign is assignment. And I will be saying single equal sign a lot this week and a lot next week. The pound sign is, um, it tells Python to ignore a line so maybe you want to type in a comment because some of our programming assignments require that you type in information that's for the professor or that explains that you know what you're doing. But Python can't, um, can't run that. It can't put past that line of code to the interpreter. So we need to comment it. We need to make it so that the interpreter skips it. We also have new arithmetic operators. These are pretty much what we have in normal math. We have addition, subtraction, uh, multiplication, division, and then exponent, which is just the double star. All programs have a flow. Every single one of them has the same flow. Input, process, output. That is the basic flow of all computer programs that there are. And maybe, you know, AI will help us determine a new way to program. But for right now, it's input, process, output. So input is external input. What, what is somebody using their joystick for? What is somebody typing on the keyboard? Process is what we do with that. 
are we going to modify it? Are we going to use it to make a, you know, a player move to the right or a player move to the left? And output is actually what happens on the screen. So output can be the player moves to the right, the player moves to the left. For our purposes, it's going to probably be textual. Or it is going to be textual. And we're going to print something back. Um, input is the way Zybooks controls your program for the labs. Output is the way Zybooks determines if your lab ran correctly. So you got to be really careful about input and output when you're, especially when you're dealing with Zybooks, because Zybooks is um, it cares about spaces and tabs and things like that. So the very basic building block of a Python script is a variable. Now, what is a variable? A variable is a bucket where you store something. And for us, it's just storing a piece of information. It can be a name. It can be a, an age. It can be a lot of different things. There, um, every variable name in your script has to be unique, period. And variables exist in a very specific scope. Now, everything we do for in Module 1 and Module 2 is in the global scope. So we won't even talk about scope. On Module 3, we're going to talk about scope. It is not something that Zybooks talks about, but I believe it's very important to understand how to format your code, because how you format it determines whether or not Python is going to run it correctly. So when you think of a variable, it's a bucket. The bucket has a scope, it has a name, and it contains a value. If you're con you know, concerned about what a variable is, think about a bucket that you've written a name on with your Sharpie. So a rule. Variable names must start with a character. They may not include spaces or special characters. They can use an underscore, and that's it. But it has to start with um, a character. Doesn't matter if it's an uppercase character or a lowercase character, but it has to start with a character. Okay, let's talk about how to define a variable. Um, in the left here, and this is just the way I, I set up my slides. Um, I have a Python script. It's in the blue box. That Python script is going to have what's the name of a variable. The variable name here is num underscore people. To the right of my variable, there is a single equal sign. And to the right of that, there is a value. Now, that value could have been one of four types. This time, it happens to be an integer. And we will talk some about types. When we are reading a Python script, I know it's a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Now, what does a variable have to do with computer storage? A variable has to do with computer storage because by defining a variable, we are taking up computer memory. It's that simple. We are giving we are the name and then the value are stored in RAM because RAM is where we're actually running. Computers have two resources. They have space and they have speed. Speed is generally about the memory of a computer. So when you are running a Python script, you are running it in RAM, which is a form of memory. And everything we do takes up some space. So when you create a variable, you are taking up space. And this is how you're taking up space in RAM. Python is going to put the variable num people, kind of like an address book. And then it's going to put the value of what it is. And every time you use num underscore people, Python is going to substitute out that value. Now why do I want to do this? Why can't I just use one? Well, I want to do this because that the value that is in num people might change. Maybe I don't want the value always to be one. Maybe I want it to be you know, A, B, C, D, E at some point in time. So 
that's why we do this. We define a variable to hold a piece of information. That piece of information is going to be stored in the, in the computer memory associated with the variable name so that we can get at it later. Variable names must not be a Python keyword. So when you look for all the Python keywords, go um, and look in Zybooks for section 1.14. There are a bunch of them. OK, how do we use a variable? So I just told you how to define a variable. There are two portions of it. You define it, and then you read it. So you create it, and you read it. So if I look at my little Python script here, and everything's in the global scope, I have one, two, three variables. I have a variable called total coins, and its value is zero. I have a variable called nickel, and we don't know what its value is, but somebody's going to input it. We have a variable called dime count. Somebody's going to put into it. At some point in time, total coins is going to equal nickel count plus dime count. And then we're going to print out total coins. So there is a bunch of new stuff going on here. Total coins is a variable. It is assigned the value of zero. I know total coins is a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. I'm going to sound like a broken record tonight. I'm going to be saying left-hand side of a single equal sign a lot. But that is so that when you go back and you begin to read your programs, you look at this and automatically know, oh, that's a variable. It's starting to categorize the different things in a program. So now I have another variable called nickel count. Nickel count is equal to something we haven't seen before. I have int and I have input and I have all these parentheses. And I'm going to be talking more about that in just a little bit. So we're going to hold off I'm talking about input until a couple more slides from now. And the same thing happens with dime count. But there are now three variables, nickel count and dime count. Now, nickel count and dime count, because they're using that input function, their values can change, which is why I want to use nickel count and dime count. I don't want to just put in a value. Because then I can go and I can correctly say total coins is nickel count plus dime count, and Python is just going to pull those values out of memory. And then I'm going to use the print function to output it. And again, we're going to talk about the print function in just a little bit. OK, there are four types of variables in Python, a string. And if Python can't figure out what it is, Python's going to assume it's a string. An integer, which is a whole number, just like 42, a floating point number, which just, it's floating point because it has a decimal in it, and a Boolean. And we're not going to worry about Boolean until we get to module three, because that's where we're going to need it. OK, so let's talk about a quick foray into functions, and then we're going to start to get into some actual code. For now, um, a function in Python code, oh, wait a minute. A function is Python code that you don't have to write. God, why did I spell write like that? What's wrong with me? OK, that's going to change in module 5. But for now, that's what a function is. I don't have to write my code. Um, no, that's not right either. Sorry. No, W-R-I-T-E. There we go. Sorry, I'm dyslexic, so it, it can easily be one of 15 different words. So now I know I have the right word. So a function is Python code that you don't have to write. Somebody else has written it for you, and for right now, it's all coming from Python. Python has massive amounts of functions that you get for free. And if you want to look at them, you can go to the URL here, which is docs.python.org, and then the value. So what is the format of a function? A function has a name, and the naming is very much like variable names. 
you have an open parenthesis and a closed parenthesis, and you have to have an open parenthesis and a closed parenthesis. And then you have you can have stuff in the middle of those parentheses, parentheses and they're called arguments. Um, some functions will return a value, and some functions have arguments. But the you can when you are reading your Python code, you can understand that it's a function because it has a name and at least an open and closed parenthesis. At that point, you know you have a function and something is going to happen. Okay. Oh, why did that happen too? My apologies. Converting types using functions. So we saw that int surrounded by an input, or an input surrounded by an int. So some of the first functions we're going to use for convert are converter functions, and they do things like change types. So we have the three types that we care about this week and next week. We have an integer, a float, and a string. Well, that's all fine, but sometimes you're going to have to convert. And a lot of what you're going to be converting is a string to an integer. When you use the input function, when you're getting stuff from the exterior of the program, when somebody's typing on the console, into the interior of the program, that is always going to be a string. And I cannot add a string and an integer together. I certainly can't multiply them because it's a string. So I have to tell, have a way to tell Python, this isn't really a string, it's an integer, and I want to use it for arithmetic operations. So that's what we do. We tell it to convert it to an int. So if I want to convert a string to an int, I use the int function, the argument inside the parentheses is the, val is the name of the string variable, or excuse me, the name of a variable containing a string. And the output from that is an integer that was the string. So I would have 42 as opposed to quote, four two quote. Floats the same way, it just says give me back a float from this string and stir, the function stir, can convert anything into a string. And that's kind of important sometimes when you're doing formatted output. So we're going to keep these three things in mind now that we're going to talk much more closely about the input function. The input function is a way to get input into your script. And I just use the word input a lot. But it's the way that we have to get used to for this class because that's how Zybooks is going to pass us information to test our code. So the name of the function is input, all lowercase. By the way, Python is a case sensitive space delimited language, you have to make sure that your cases and spaces are correct. So the input, the name of the function is input. I have open and close parentheses. And in the middle, there's something that I say is an optional argument. You don't have to have arguments. And after this week, you won't. You pretty much, until you get to your game, won't really worry about having input have um, any arguments in it. Input returns a value, and it returns the value of what a user has typed in to the console. Um, so that's good. So now let's talk about the output. The output is the opposite. It's sending information back to the console. And it's a way to display data to the user. That's all it is. Now, Zybooks is going to take the value from print and try and do an exact, mat, an exact match to what it has in its database as the correct answer. So you might get very frustrated that it's telling you that you didn't do something right when you're looking at it and you're saying, but all the right words are there. And it may be spacing. Now, if you're in my class, I don't take off points for spacing. So I go back through 
everybody's iBook Labs, and if there's an issue, I look at what the issue is so I can tell you what the issue is. But if the issue is spacing, and that's all it is, I give you back all the points that iBooks took away because it's ridiculous for you to pull your hair out trying to get a space right. So print takes one mandatory argument and an optional second argument. And we're going to learn how to actually put that mandatory argument in there in just a minute. But it takes a string. And, and because it has to give something back, that's what it's giving back is that string. So we're going to do an input-output example, and then we're going to go to code. This is challenge 1.3.4. So I have a Python script. In my Python script, I have two variables. The name of the first variable is num1. The name of the second variable is num2. Num1 is expecting input, and num2 is expecting input. And I'm going to output the sum of num1 and num2. So when I make the function call, um, we always execute it from inside out. So it's going to say input is going to happen first, and then the conversion is happening second. So I can actually look at as almost two different lines of code. I can say my var equal input, and then num1 equals int my var. So what I'm using there is a shorthand, but it's a shorthand that's used all over Zybooks. So it's something that is important to get used to now. Um, print can use a string, integer, or float, or Boolean values. If a string is provided, you have to convert anything that is not a string to a string somehow. And there's a couple different ways to do it. This week you're using the stir function. So we're now going to stop, and I'm going to go to PyCharm, and we're going to look at that script, and we're going to watch it run. So uh, just make sure. Yeah, yeah. We're going to go to 3.14. 3.14, yes. Which slide was that, Brian? Probably there's an error. If you want to let me know what slide it is, we'll come back to it and I'll see if there's yeah, an error. It was error. the one prior to input where you were. Uh... This one. Yeah. So under float, where it says pi equals float 3.14, should that be float parentheses my string? Yes. OK. I apologize. I redid these recently. So I just want to I'm sure I wasn't but thank you very misunderstanding. much. Well, certainly. Oh, thank you very much for finding that. So this is PyCharm. Now, some people, uh, when you download PyCharm, you want to download the Community Edition. They make it a little hard to find because IntelliJ sells PyCharm with a license, and they'll give you a 30-day free trial. But what you want is you want the community edition because that's completely free. So let's go to 1.3.4. And I'm going to edit the configuration. One 1.3.4. So what I have here is I have what we just saw in the slide. Oh, let me make this bigger so that people can actually see it. OK. I just have the same thing I had in the slide, except I've added this. I've, I've added this you know, input another number, because I wanted to just show you what's going on. Now, this looks a little different than the slide. It's going to look a little different than Zybooks. And that's because. PyCharm as an IDE, an integrated development environment, gives you certain things that makes life easier. Um, one of them is syntax. It checks your syntax as you're typing. And so if you see something red, there's a problem. One of my favorite features of any IDE, and especially PyCharm, is what they call the debugger. 
And I like the debugger because I can watch what's happening on every line of code as it happens and control what happens when. So what I have done is I have opened my Python script. I have told it that I want the configuration for the, I wanted, I edited the configuration and pointed it to this script so that Python knew what to run because I've got a lot of stuff here. And then I could run it and that's just going to run it through or I could debug it. And debugging it is going to allow me to step. So the first thing I have to do in a debugger is I have to tell it where to stop because otherwise it's just going to run through. And that's that red dot here. This is called a breakpoint. And a breakpoint, you simply add it by clicking to the right of the number. Just put your mouse there and click. And a red dot shows up and you get this little kind of red uh, transparent line. And that just tells Python, stop. Just stop and wait for someone to do something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the debugger. And what we see now is we see this blue line. This blue line is Python waiting for me to step over, me to tell it what to do. Do I execute this line of code? OK. So I have not yet executed. I haven't done anything. If I go to the console, the console is blank. And this is what I mean by a console. It's just a text screen. So my console is blank. And what do I want to do? Well, I want to execute line number 13. So I'm going to step over. See, this? the bent arrow is step over. So I'm going to step over. Now I'm waiting. And I know I'm waiting because that little uh, the little carrot changed from three carrots to a carrot and a question. So I know that I'm going to have to input a number, so I'm going to input 42. Now, if I look back up here again, my blue line has moved to line 14. So I have, still haven't done anything for line 14. Oh, and I can go to my debugger tab, and I can look over here, and I can see that I have now got a, a variable called num1. It has a value of 42, and that 42 is an integer. That's pretty cool. So I can always know what my values are. And if I'm looking at the, looking at the code itself, this num1 colon 42 means that at this moment in time, that variable num1 is in fact the value 42. So these are just some nice things that a debugger does. So I've stepped over it. Now I'm going to uh, now I'm going to step over line 14 and it's going to wait and this time it printed out input another number. Where did that come from? That came from right here. Because if I have an argument in the input function, it will print it to the screen. So it's telling me that I need to do something. It's giving me, the user, a clue as to what I need to do. So I'm going to input the number 17. It's just a number. So now if I step over, I'm now on line 16. I have not executed line 16 yet. If I go back to the debugger, I can see I have num1, which is 42, and it's an integer. And now I have this new num2, and it is an integer, 17. So now I'm going to print num1 and num2. When I step over, I'm actually, Python's actually going to execute this against the computer, and it comes back with number, and put another number 59, because I didn't do what I should have done. So let's do this. Let's put a new line there. And let's put, just to see how it changes, first number and a new line. So now what I'm going to do to show the contrast is I'm going to run it. 
So this is run. And I will say input the first number. You'll notice there's no blue lines here. And that's because I'm running it. I'm not debugging it. So I'm going to input the first number of 42. I hit the Enter key, input another number. I'm going to input the number 17. And it's going to output 59. So I've just executed a script in PyCharm. And um, I have used input, output, and I should input, print, and the int function. Okie dokie. Let's go back to, yeah, I got it here. So a little bit more about print. Print's a very important function for this class. And so we need to know about some of its nuances. And some of its nuances are a little strange. Um, print takes a single string argument, um, but it also puts out a new line. So you'll have, uh, I think in this one, you'll have a lab, I don't know if it's in this one or the next one, sorry, where you don't want to use the new line right after print, because print does that. It's just going to give you a new line. So you have to be careful of that. Um, so here's are some example of string arguments. I can simply put a string in there, like 3, 2, 1, go. So that's what it will output, is, a, is 3, 2, 1, go. I can I can do an arithmetic expression in it. We saw that happen in the program we just did, which is 2 plus 2, and that's 4. Um, so Python, if it has, uh, let's say, an integer, it's going to automatically convert that to a string. And then if um, I need to have a string and an integer together, I could then use the stir function. Just like I used the int function before on the input, I can use the stir function on the output. And then I can also just print word one, print word two. And if I print if the last one, excuse me. OK. The last one, uh, you don't, it automatically puts a new line. So, uh, yeah, so there is, um, okay, so we need this for lab 1.23. Print takes two arguments. And the second, the first time we only saw print in with one argument. The second argument is whether or not it ends in that new line. And you're going to need this for lab 1.23. And I want it to end in something other than a new line. I don't want somebody to have hit the return key. So what I'm going to do is I've got this special uh, variable that I can add to it called end. And I can tell it what it equals. Now, it has to equal a string, but a string can be a space. And that's what we're going, that's what we have here. We have print word one comma end equal quote space quote. What that does is it's going to say word one space. And then when I print word two, it's going to say word two space. So the end argument is a special argument to print, and you're going to need it a couple of times for this class. See if anybody's got any questions. Okay. Anybody still there? Oh, good. So let's uh, watch example 1.7 in action. Which one was that? 1.7. Okay. What does the end mean? The slash n is a new line. So there are, um, when you are, um, when you are trying to control a program or control what's happening in your program, you have to understand how to do certain things. 
And this is what we call an escape character. An escape character is one that doesn't print out as a string. And we'll talk a little bit more about this next week. But the escape character is, a, is an ASCII character and it's an indication to do something special. In this case, the slash n is an indication to put a new line. So it's like you hit the return key and you, and you go to the next line. That's what the slash n does. And the slash t does a tab and there's a bunch of them. They're invisible when it comes, um, I can show you that after class. So after the lecture, I will go out and I'll show you where to get the pie charm from. Um, and there's also something in module two about it. So slash n and slash t and a bunch of others are invisible characters. You can't see them. They don't show up on the screen. You didn't see a slash n anywhere in this output. And it basically is a carriage return. That's what it is. Um, so that, that's, and that's why we use it. We use it because we want to make things look a little better on the screen. And you're going to need to have stuff like that for your game. Okie dokie. No problem. And we can go over um, where to get PyCharm downloads. It's from IntelliJ. Um, but yeah, you want to make sure that you get the Community Edition one. So example 1. Point, I don't know what that, why I said 1.7 there. What am I talking about? Let's look. OK. That's format. So N is for new lines and space is for spaces. That's right. What was I talking about? Hold on. One point. Let's do that. One point three point two. I don't know why I said one point seven. That one? Nope. That's not the one I wanted. I think I wanted one with multiple prints and the end in it. Format. Nope. I'm sorry. I don't know what I did. Escape. That's the escape one. That's the add one. Simple print. There we go. I was looking for 1.7, but there isn't a 1.7. So I have to go back and figure out what I was looking for. But in this case, we're just going to use simple print. And we will show you what the end means. So again, I'm going to use the debugger because I like the debugger. You don't have to use the debugger. There's nothing in the class that says you have to. Come on. OK, let's try this again. I do not know what is going on with my computer tonight. This one is an operator error. All right, come on. All right, we're just going to have to leave this one like that. Because for some reason, there we go, I just got my scroll bar. OK. So this is just a bunch of print statements. So I'm not taking anything in, I'm just going to print things out to the keyboard, to the console. I'm just going to do it in a couple different ways. So I'm going to run the debugger by hitting the little thing that looks like a bug. And I'm sorry. OK, let me stop it and should tell you what I did wrong. What I did wrong is up here, I'm still on challenge 1.3.4. So when I ran it, it said, OK, you want to run challenge 1.3.4. I neglected to go and change it to simple print. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here. I'm going to edit the configuration. This is the configuration. If it tells you you don't have a Python interpreter, this is where you put in your Python interpreter. 
and I'm going to go over to script path and I'm going to point it to the simple print. And now I'm going to debug it because it's going to debug simple print this time. I'm going to debug it. And did I hit run? Simple print. I do not know why this is not working. Debug. Okay. There we go. I have no idea why that did weird things. So let's go and run this through the debugger. So I am on line three. You'll see that here at the console, I haven't done anything. When I step over line three, it's going to output to the screen the word hello, exactly what was in here. When I step over the next one, it's going to output the words hello again, exactly what was in here. Looks exactly the same. But you'll notice that there's a carriage return between hello and hello again. I didn't put that carriage return in there. It's certainly not in, in these. It's not in those strings. That's because print assumes a new line. If I do not want that a new line, I have to give it something different. And there's the special syntax for that is saying, I have a comma here, so I have hello, like I had before, just like I had at line three, but this time I've added a comma, and you have to have the, have the comma, and I've added the word end equal, and you'll notice that end is not in quotes, because it's actually a variable name, and it has to be named end, end, and we have to have the equal sign after it. And then, in this case, I'm going to put a space. So that's what's in between those, those quotes. I can put something else in between those quotes, and in a minute I will. So I'm going to step over it, and now I've got hello, but you, it looks like the hello that went before it. However, on the next line, after special end. So there was no new line here. It was a space. So now let's change this. Let's change this to a star and see what happens. So we're just going to debug it again, and I won't run through. I'll, I'll just quickly get to that point. So now I have a star, and we'll see a star, and then I'll see after special end. So now let's use a tab. So we're going to do a slash T, which is the escape sequence, a special set of characters, to tab it. So now let's do it again. So we're just going to step over, step over. Now, let's go to the console. I've got hello and hello again. When I step over hello, I just have a hello. It doesn't look like I did anything different than that first hello. However, when I do after special end, you'll notice that there's all this space in between them, and that's actually a tab. So those are invisible characters. Slash T and slash N are the ones you're going to use the most. Um, but you are going to need the space for lab 1.23. OK, so N is for new lines, and space is for spaces. That's right. Yes, that's right. So let us talk about why cases and spaces matter. Python is a case-sensitive, space-delimited language. That means that a capital X is not the same as a lowercase x. Those are two separate variables. One is a capital X, one is a lowercase x. And I see students, especially new students who've never programmed before, oftentimes mixing that up, and they don't understand why they're having problems with their code. And that is because it's case sensitive. And we come, most students come from a world of Windows where things are not case sensitive. But in Python, everything is case sensitive. Space delimited. What space delimited means is that, um, I don't know why that's happening at this point. What space delimited means 
is that you have to have things at the right place at the right time. Some languages like Java and C and C++ are delimited by certain characters like a semicolon or a squiggly bracket. Python isn't, except for the colon, which we'll get to in module three. But for the most part, everything has to be on its own line. And the, and the way Python knows it's a different line of code is because there's actually a new line there. So you'll see that the space delimited here, which I have x1 equal x, um, x1 equal x equal 2 and y equal 4 is correct, but the same thing, x equal 2 space y equal 4 is wrong. And that's because Python is reading x equal 2 space y equal 4 as a single statement, and it can't be a single statement. Those are two separate statements. Those assignments for those two variables have to be on two separate lines. So, uh, okay, so this is just showing where the RAM is, and this is just showing what the issue is associated with those lines. Not all characters vis are visible. We just talked about this, but I'll say it again. There's something called the ASCII table, and that is a numerical and hexadecimal representation for every single character on your keyboard. Um, and then there are other tables when you get to other special keyboards. Every single character has a numerical representation. So a space is represented by the number 32. Now you can't type 32 in and get a space. The Python representation is a quote space quote for a space. A tab is a slash T and a new line is a slash N. When you use slash T or slash N, you will not see the characters slash N on the screen just like we saw before. Handling special characters. Is, I'm sorry, I, I should have said backslash. The backslash is a special character in and of itself, and in between quotes, it can cause you to go crazy. Um, if you want the backslash actually to print out in a string, you have to put two of them. It's called double backslash. Um, it's an escape sequence for the backslash because the backslash is used in every other escape sequence. If I want a single quote, I have to backslash it. If I'm inside single quotes, if I'm inside double quotes, I don't have to. If I have a double quote inside double quotes, then I have to backslash it. But if I am inside quotes, single quotes, I don't. If I want a new line, I do slash N. And if I want a tab, I do slash T, backslash T, sorry. So, my suggestion is if you are typing something that's going to have to have, let's say, a single quote, you make sure that the string is delimited by double quotes because otherwise you get into all this backslash stuff. The only time in this class when you have to use um, escape sequences is going to be when you have to use a new line or when you have to use a tab when you are formatting your output for your so that this is just an example of what it is that you're going to have. You're going to see this in Zybook. The last two are the ones that you have to concentrate on. So we're going to go out and review the labs. So um, and then we'll open it up to talk about anything. And I'll show you guys where PyCharm is and things like that. Does anybody have any questions actually before I start? No. Okay. So the mechanism that I use in Module 1 and Module 2 to go over labs are called flowcharts. And they give you a visual representation of the flow of the code. And they give you an indication of kind of what you have to do. After that, in Module 3, we're start, going to start using pseudocode. Now, for Module 3 and Module 4, I believe I still give you guys the flowcharts. Um, and by the way, links to these are up on the Google Drive. So, um, so it's a progression. 
and we're going to start by looking at it from more of a pictorial uh, tool, and then we're going to go into a more verbal tool. And part of that is because the flow charts become massive in Module 3. So let's just read through this for a minute because there are some clues that Zybooks gives you about what you have to do. So you're going to complete the program to read four values from input. This says you're going to use the input function four times. You're going to have four different statements, and each statement is going to have an input, which means you're going to have four, at minimum, four separate variables. And store, in that, store the values in variables while they give us the variable names. First underscore name, generic underscore location, whole underscore number, excuse me, and plural underscore noun. The program uses the input values to output a short story. So you're going to have to have four um, input statements, and you're going to have to and by the way, if you name your variables identical to how they tell you, the output stuff just happens like it should. So I have a start. All flowcharts have a start. And by the way, you're going to have to do a flowchart in a couple weeks. So this is a good uh, introduction to the flowcharts. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to input the first name. And then I'm going to input the generic location and the whole number and the plural noun. By the way, these shapes mean something. So if you're in my class and you're doing flowcharts, you need to look at the, uh, the information, I think it's in module two, where they tell you about what the shapes and what they mean. So these shapes mean something. Um, the tilted rectangle is input and output. Um, the, yeah, or the, the square is process, and then um, in module three we'll get to the diamond, which is decisions. So then I'm going to output, and then I'm going to end. So I have to have four input statements and one output statement. The output statement, I believe, is already given to you. So you don't have to worry about that output statement. All you have to do is make sure that each of these inputs is correct. Um, you've got, so you've got first underscore name equal input with open and close parentheses. The same with generic location and whole number. Now whole number might be an integer, but I don't think it, I don't think it matters and then plural noun. So now let's review lab 1.12. So it's the three parts. A value like usernum can store, a, a variable like usernum can store a value like an integer. This is a big indication that you're going to have to do input and int. So like we did earlier, like we did you know, in one of those scripts, we're going to have to have input and int. Um, expand the given program as included. Output the user's input, two points. So somebody's got a usernome, so now you're going to print usernome. Output the input squared and cubed. So this means that you really have to make sure usernome is an integer because you're going to square it and you're going to cube it. Um, and then you're going to get a second input to user num2. So user num2 is going to be just like user num1, except the variable name is user num2, and you're going to output the sum and the product. So we have a start. We're going to have an input. We're going to convert user num to an integer. Now something to know about flowcharts, and we'll also talk about this with um, pseudocode, is that they are language agnostic. They do not represent any specific language. So when you have something like we saw earlier where you've got int, open parentheses, input, open parentheses, close parentheses, close parentheses, um, you have to 
you have to break that apart when you're doing flowcharts. So I've broken it apart here. But it doesn't mean that you have to do it in two separate steps. You can do it in that one step like we've seen previously. Then I'm going to square usernum, and I'm going to output the squared usernum. And then, whoops, I'm going to cube usernum. I'm going to output the cube of usernum. And then I'm going to get usernum2. And I'm going to convert user num to an integer, user num two to an integer, and I'm going to sum user num one and user num two, and then I'm going to output the sum, and then I'm going to multiply user num and user num two, and I'm going to output the product, and then I'm going to end. So that's the flow of lab 1.12, and Output means call the print function. Every time in Zybooks, it says output, you call the print function. Okay, write a program using integers usernum and x and output usernum divided by x three times. Now, some students get this wrong because they, they read that differently than what Zybooks is intending. So I'm going to input usernum and I'm going to input x. Now given the fact that it says divided by x three times, it means these have to be integers. So again, you're going to use that int open parenthesis input open close parenthesis close parenthesis. And I'm going to convert usernum to an <clears throat> to an integer and I'm going to convert x to an integer. And then I'm going to say div equal usernum divided by x. I'm going to output div. And this is where students start to get lost on this one and it's because it doesn't want you to divide user num by x three times. It wants you to divide user num by x and then the product of that first uh, division needs to be divided the second time and then so forth. So this says div2 is going to be div divided by x and we're going to output div2. And then we've got div3 divided, uh, div2 divided by x. And we're going to output it, and we're going to end. So it says create two variables and two input function calls. So when it's saying something like that, using integers, user num, and x as input, and then print is output. Now, you as time goes on, I'm not going to be giving you know, these little clues. These types of little clues, I'm going to give clues associated with that week's um, lesson. So we're going to write a program using input, age, weight, heart rate, time, respectively. And then we're going to output each floating point value with two digits, um, output the average calories burned for, per person. Now, I think it gives you the average calories burned per person um, calculation in lab 1.24. So make sure you name the variables exactly as they are for that calculation and make sure that calories, lowercase, is the variable on the left hand side of that equation. So you're going to have calories equal in that big long equation. And then I'm going to print out with two digits. So something we didn't talk about, and it's always I, I'm always trying to figure out what exactly do we need to talk about and what don't we need to talk about so that everybody's not up until forever. Um, so here you see a special notation. It is um, left curly bracket colon dot two f right curly bracket. And then you see the colon and then dot format. And by the way, you get this. They, you don't have to write that. So as long as your variable name is calories, this will come out correct. But that is something we're going to talk about more next week. We're going to talk about how to format things a little different. So here is the flowchart. We're going to input age. We're going to input weight. We're going to input heart rate, and we're going to input time. 
And then there, we're going to do this calculation that they give us. Well, first of all, we're going to convert everything to integer because this is a flow chart. I have to do it in separate steps. And then we're going to calculate calories. And we're going to output that. And then we're going to end. So that's lab 1.24. So make sure your variables are named the same as the, the variables are in the calculation for calories. And this is just that. And that's the output. Last lab for the night. So we're going to prompt the user to input an integer between 32 and 126 and a float and a character and a string, storing each into separate variables and output those four values on a single line separated by space. This is where you need that comma and equal space. And then also output in reverse. So you're going to output um, the integer, the float, the character, and the string, and then you're going to input the string, the character, the float, and the integer. And then we're going to convert the integer to a character by using the chr function. And that's just like using the int or the string function. So I'm going to input all my stuff. I'm going to convert the integer. I didn't. Uh, oh, I didn't need to do that. And then I'm going to output it, and then I'm going to output in the other order, and then I'm going to convert user int to character, and I'm going to output the character, and then I'm done. So that was all the labs, and these, and also the slides will be up on the Google Drive sometime tomorrow. So we can open it up and talk if you want. Um, whoops. And um, Joseph, I let me give you a quick show where PyCharm is. Um, IntelliJ is the company that does it, and you can go to the IntelliJ site, and then what you want is you want PyCharm. Now, you have this download here. That download is for the paid version. You do not want to download that. It'll say you have a 30-day free trial. You want to do this fully-fledged professional or community or free community. Where's the free community? Uh, sorry, hit that download. I was wrong. Hit that download, and then uh, where is the uh, where's the community? That don't want the 30-day free trial. Uh, community edition. It's all the way down here. So let me copy this in. You don't want the Mac, though. So let me put that in the chat. Okay. So go down past all of the purchase stuff. Go down, go down, go down, and then download it here. And you'll probably download an EXE for Windows. I'm on a Mac, so that's why I get the .dmg. So that is where um, you're going to want to go to download it. You're also going to have to install Py Python. And those instructions are in Module 2, but if you want to do them now, that's fine. And if you're in my class and you're trying to do that and having a problem, please contact me and also send me an image of what it is you're doing because I can help you a little easier. So I know we did a lot of stuff. Does anybody have any questions? Are there any concerns you want to talk about? Going once. Going twice. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting for everyone, and I hope that you found it helpful, and this will be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow. Good night, everybody.